let me take a moment to introduce this uh, incredible group who've, who've joined us and who are really experts in this topic with many years of experience. I'll start at the very end with uh, Maurice uh, Levy. He, he's been coaching me on how to pronounce his last name, so thank you, Maurice. Years uh, ago. <laughs> Maurice is the former CEO and current chairman of Publicis Group. And next we have Simon Freakley, who is the CEO of Alex Partners. We have Paul Bulky, the former CEO and now board chairman of Nestle. And Andre Kudelski, who is a CEO and chairman of the Kudelski Group. And if you're wearing a badge, you're wearing one of his products. He called it the seen and unseen security product. Um, and as I said, it's truly a great privilege to have uh, these, these individuals here in the room with us today to talk about today's topic, agility at all costs, which I think is a, is a nice uh, way to segue to the end of Davos because we've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution um, for the past week, but we all know there's going to be a fifth industrial revolution and probably a sixth and a seventh, and that, that speaks to the need to be agile uh, and what that means what the costs of agility are, what's the cost of maintaining the status quo, um, how do you think about the trade-offs and the big bets that businesses have to take in the face of uh, driving for agility. Um, I thought it would be interesting to start us off by defining what agility means. There have been some other panels on it, and, and I think we all have uh, different definitions of it. So I'm, uh, a wise person told me once, um, when I started in the business world that um, agility is uh, falling down seven times and standing up eight times. Um, but I want to turn to Maurice to ask him to kick us off by describing what does agility mean to you? I'm not sure I'm the most qualified to determine what uh, agility means, but uh, I, I will uh, uh, try to define it, making sure that uh, all my colleagues will uh, make a correction and will add and change because agility is quite difficult to, uh, to define. The first thing is that we should make a, a clear difference between flexibility and agility. Flexibility is very often and mostly uh, the possibility of uh, adjusting your workforce uh, according to uh, the production that you have. And uh, the way you, you do it in order to be productive and uh, uh, quite profitable is to uh, have a fixed workforce for the minimum charge and then to have temps and interims that will uh, uh, complete uh, uh, for the ups that you may face. Agility is, above all, a state of mind. It is a very deep change vis-à-vis -vis, uh, flexibility and the way you are most of the time operating, particularly <coughs> in the world that uh, uh, we live in, which is this uh, VUCA world, uh, which is volatile, uh, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And in this VUCA world, you need to uh, move very fast and be extremely agile. And this means that not only you have to think fast, but you have to act even faster than you think. It's a little bit like the fastest shooter in the West. We will shoot before he has even seen the target. And uh, this means that uh, in terms of organization, you have to have the whole organization which is behind you, which is thinking the same way. You have to de-silo the organization because if uh, you have an organization with the legacy a system of department and all these heavy fiefdoms where everyone is protecting his own fiefdom. At the end of the day, you are blocked and you cannot be agile. You have also to be uh, very open to the new world and new ideas. It, as I said, it's a state of mind. There is a lot of uh, competition which is coming from various ways of uh, uh, the world. It is uh, not only a new country or a new approach or a new product, but it's a new startup which is uh, changing quite dramatically the way things uh, are were done and the way they are done today. So a, a huge change. L let's take the example of Uber. It has changed the way uh, we, we are 
uh, transported. Uh, and it is uh, also the uh, a team spirit where everyone is aligned and everyone is working in the same direction. And everyone is reacting with that uh, need of high speed. Roughly, uh, this is what I think it is, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Simon, Paul, André will say, no, 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 no. Agility is something very different, and I will tell you what it is. <laughs> so let, let me ask, uh, André, do you, do you agree with Maurice's <coughs> definition? Partially yes, partially no. So I would I use... You. <laughs> I, I would use a different image first, just to say that agility you need at the same time to look in one direction that is a little bit further down the road, but at the same time to avoid to take the stone or the carpet that is just close to your feet. So fundamentally, there is one very important element is to be able to be proactive and to anticipate. And as Maurice has said, said that very well, to shoot before you have really seen the visible element of the risk is what you should achieve. Now, regarding volatility and elements of complexity in the today's world, some people look first at the sum of the elements that looks completely, if I would say, disorganized and not making sense. But in reality, it's a combination of the sum of very logical elements where this sum is becoming unpredictable. And then you need to have this capability to still have a very clear idea where you want to go, but to take into account what is happening every day to avoid to be completely disoriented by what is happening to you each day. Right. And that is something that is not easy because it's true that in organization, on one side, you try to optimize everything, for example, for cost, by organizing things in a very systematic way. But more you are systematic in the way you organize, less you will be agile. And sometimes, and I'm using often this model to say that in a company, you should not have just one model. You should have, like the Chinese concept, one country to system, you need to be able to have within a company different type of element because you don't have all the companies that is facing exactly the same danger, the same opportunity. At the same time, you need to have a global alignment, but to allow each individual part to be able to react in its own sub-ecosystem in a way that is making sense. Paul, Simon, any? Actually, there is a more agile way of defining agility. Um, Agility is to be there when you have to be there. It is, uh, it, it is the ability of, of, of thinking, understanding, fast and, and move fast. Uh, in whatever context, uh, you can do that personally, uh, at home uh, or a company, etc. It is actually, uh, I think, first mental and then physical in the sense of moving physical structures towards. But it has a meaning, it has a purpose. Uh, it, uh, agility is, is, has a certain dimension of purpose. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges. And now we say with the Ford Industrial Revolution and all, uh, everything is going so fast. It's because we have selective memory. It has always gone fast. It just goes faster. But the capabilities of going faster is, is, uh, are, are, are more present too. Now, agility is not only uh, speed. Eh? It is, it is adaptable. It's understanding and then adjust towards to be successful. Simon, anything you would add? Well, all I would say, Moni, is obviously agility is a, um, a hot topic at the moment, but agility has been an issue forever. I mean, the best companies have always read their markets, they've always responded to those markets, they've always served their customers uh, better than their competition. So I think agility is a constant. I think we're focusing on it now for two reasons. One is because the rate of technological change means that we really have to be on the front foot. And secondly, in public company markets, you know, the role of the activist now has become very important. And so, you know, corporations have to become their own disruptors, their own activists to make sure they're a step ahead. So I think agility absolutely is a key topic, but I don't think it's a new topic. Well, let me um, ask a question. I'll, I'll turn to Paul for a moment. I mean, you've all given a slightly different take on agility. And there's a lot of words like state of mind and um, uh, moving with speed, uh, you know, complexity. But Paul, as, as uh, the 
former CEO of a, of a very big, complex global company. Can you measure it? Can you measure agility? Oh, yeah, there is, there is one big measure. Uh, if you still exist tomorrow or after tomorrow, in five <laughs> years' time, somewhere you have been proven to be agile, I must say, because you, 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 you continue to be successful in, 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 in a very fast-changing VUCA world, if you want. So um, we, we're living in a world that you want to measure with one number everything. Uh, and that's not possible, but I think it, if you're a company and you continue owning your agenda, uh, you can work with your own beliefs, you maintain your strategic direction, and you deliver results, etc. Is, is that creates a false impression of stability to some extent, and yet at the same time there's a lot of intensity and agility behind these figures. So I think the normal uh, measurements that you have, over time, being successful is the best measure. But let, let me uh, poke at that just a little bit, and I'll, I'll open this up for you, um, because I think it's a really interesting point. There's, there's a balance between producing quarterly results for your shareholders um, versus this long-term strategic need to be agile, be ahead of the market. Again, How do you balance that? Yeah, but again, we don't, first of all, we don't, we are not quarterly defined. We are a long-term thinking company. We don't have full quarterly results, and we don't, we don't work for quarterly results. We work behind the strategic direction, the purpose. We have our values, we have our structures, we have our strategic direction, we have our way we go about it, so the what and the how and the why are there, and we do that and do that with a consistency that then, as a result, deliver results. And, and that's how we actually see these things. Um, I know there are important, important eyes on us every day. Not every quarter. So I, I think it's, it's also leadership of companies to say, look, we are sensitive to investors' requests and worries, and, and they have their anxieties, so there is some empathy with their anxiety. But look, at the end of the day, I feel it's, it's our obligation also as company leadership to stay, to stay true to ourselves and do the right things and, and be successful over time. We are a company that is actually formally in our statutes, we, we have to create long-term shareholder value, long-term. So quarterly is, well, it's the first step in that direction. Right. But it's not the whole game. Simon, you talked about activists right. in your comments, and it relates to what Paul was just talking about. Can you comment about the link between activism, and which has ramped up a lot in the last five years, right. and, and its role in driving agility or... Well, I think, I think what's happened is that the role of the activist has made management teams, boards of directors realize that they really have to be one step ahead. They have to be their own activists, they have to be their own disruptors because they'll either do it to themselves or if you're a public company not performing well, others will do it to you. So I think the activists actually have played a very positive role in making public company boards really understand how to remain agile and drive value for shareholders and stakeholders generally. I think that the um, there are great examples of those that got it right and those that didn't. If you look at GKN and Melrose, for instance, they were too slow and they had it done to them. Um, if you look at Unilever, um, you know, they got ahead of the game, they set out their own agenda, they did a fabulous job, in my view, of communicating what the agenda was, what they were going to do, the priorities in which they were going to do it, and then executed. And of course, if you look at the share price today, it's substantially ahead of where Kraft Heinz would have had it had they been successful in their approach. So I think that there are great examples of those that are agile and move quickly enough and those that don't. And I think that the activists who are a handful, let's face it, but the activists, I think, have been very instructive to management teams and boards about how to really reflect and be brutally honest with themselves about what needs to change in their businesses to make sure that pace is put into that change so it's not just transformation, but it's accelerated transformation. And having been brutally honest, drive the transformation that's needed by thinking big and thinking small and making sure that the transformation is delivered in terms of value and actually then don't become the recipients of the activist's attention. Well, you mentioned disrupting yourself and that that's... Uh, a conversation that activists are driving. I know, Maurice, you disrupted your own business building a digital business at Publicis. Can you talk about how you disrupt yourself while maintaining the core business and, and maintaining the, you know, the legacy and the heart of the business? Uh, as Simon said, um, agility is something that is not new. 
even if today there is a huge acceleration in uh, this uh, concept. And um, when uh, you look at uh, the way publicity has been managed, uh, uh, not only in the last 30 years, but uh, in the last 50 years, we always try to be slightly ahead of the game and of the new innovation and uh, everything which was coming as a big trend. And we, we were changing our organization almost every two, three years, even if we had no reason to do it. Not to destabilize the teams, but just to keep with the change. Because uh, if there is something which is extremely important uh, is uh, to measure the resistance of, to change of the human beings. And people hate to change. So in order to do not crystallize the organization and to do not have people who are really uh, comfortably uh, installed in their organization, we were changing. We were changing, we are moving the people from one aisle to another aisle of the building, even if we had no purpose for doing this, other than keeping them on their toes. And uh, uh, in, in the beginning of the 2000s, there has been the uh, clash of the uh, dot-com era and the bubble burst, and everyone was considering that uh, uh, digital was dead. And uh, it was relatively easy to see that that assessment was wrong because it sufficed in those days to look at the consumers and how they were behaving. And we decided in the middle of this bubble burst, when everyone was considering that they had to go out of the sector, that we have to invest heavily in that sector. And we started the negotiation in 2004 and finished in 2005 by acquiring, at a very important price, $1.3 billion, uh, which was huge and the biggest acquisition ever in that field in our organization and in our sector by acquiring Digitas. And this has changed dramatically uh, the way we were operating because we embedded digital in every single of our operation. And then we accelerated our investment, including uh, right after uh, 2008 and right after uh, the uh, fall of the Lehman Bros. Uh, uh, organization in 2009, we acquired Razorfish and then we acquired <laughs> Sapient. Transformation is uh, key not only to us, but to our clients. And if we want to help our clients to transform themselves, we have to prove that we have applied this to ourselves and that this has worked. And we are accelerating on, on that path. Last year, we have been ranked by every measure and every single uh, panel as uh, the most, uh, uh, as the number one winner in new business. And uh, the area which is growing faster at uh, more than 30% is the, the new areas where the legacy is going down. So uh, if there is something that we can say about this is maybe uh, two or three lessons. The first one is that we have been fortunate enough to see a little bit behind the hill uh, and before the competition was seeing it. Uh, the second is that um, our teams embraced uh, the change and have accepted to change the way they were working. And the third is that um, we offer to our clients solutions that many of them, not all, <laughs> and there are still some who are resisting because they are seeing us only as a creative agency, but I'm sure that soon they will see that we can bring much more than creative and the convergence of technology and creativity. And that everyone who is using this convergence is benefiting hugely from uh, what we are doing and transforming their business big time. So it's uh, something which is working well 
And that if there is one word, uh, is acceleration is really key because things are moving even faster nowadays than only two years ago. Well, let, let me uh, turn to Andre for a moment and ask about sort of a, a different uh, side of that question, which is your technology company focused on um, a lot of growth and new technologies. How do you uh, maintain in your company, the, in your experience, the ability to think small, think with agility, think about disruption as you grow and get bigger um, and have the, you know, the challenges of being a larger company? You have different dimensions, and uh, I fully share with uh, Maurice the, the opinion that things are accelerating. You have many vectors that do that things are coming faster, specifically with the hyperconnectivity that make that everything is interacting much faster. Now, having said that, you need, as a company, especially in technology, to look really how you will define the vision of the future. And you need really to work in parallel with the element where you want to go and how you will arrive there, taking into account the elements that are happening every day. Now, there is one element that is pretty important, is that, and I think it's not new, it's difficult to predict the future. And fundamentally, as a company, you need to consider that you have different scenario for a future. And you should not invest all the bet in one direction. You should keep more than one path possible. And so fundamentally, you have a strategy where you want to go and knowing that the roads can be pretty different. And that is pretty challenging because to the team, you need to give some instruction for the short term while keeping in mind the long term. And sometimes it's quite disrupting to have something where you may have some contradiction. You have said left and you say one week later, right. And people may say, oh, there is no direction. But in reality, you have one vision for the future and you may have some external elements that are influencing you. Now, one of the key things that you have with agility where you have to be careful is not to just go where agility will tell you to go by losing the bigger picture. And that is really a challenge because fundamentally, if you want to cross and to pass a hill or a mountain, you need to think what will be the path to go on the other side and not to be in a dead end. So, that is really about agility by trying to anticipate. Now, in technology and uh, as part of our uh, companies working on question of security, so basically cybersecurity or designing secure things, then you have even another dimension because fundamentally agility is to be able to quickly address how the market is moving. And that is, I would say, a positive definition. You have A-B testing. You have a lot of way to get there. But in security, it's a negative definition. You are not defining security but what a system should do, but what it should not do. Fundamentally, not reveal this secret, not do the thing in the wrong way. And that is creating one extra step of difficulty in the way you define things. And that is maybe why you have number of new technology where you have incredible opportunities that are here, but where the security <coughs> and the vulnerability are really problematic. And you are wondering, okay, with the computer and the internet, you have a lot of cyber attacks. Why it's not possible to fix it? So first, once the devil is outside of the, uh, how to say, the lamp or the box, it's very difficult to bring it back. But it's basically saying that you need, in such a situation, to think how you will have the next generation that will done with the proper architecture. And by just taking the traditional agile approach, you may be missing this part. Last point that is pretty important regarding organization. I, if I'm taking back some of the comment of Maurice, it's saying that people do not, do not want to change. Yes and no. You have 
for, for example, the basic engineer may be very interested to change, where I have seen issue is in the middle management, because they are feeling very often uncomfortable when things are changing, because fundamentally, how they exert uh, the power, how they, they drive teams, is subject to a change, and that is not always comfortable for them. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit because the human side of this you've all sort of touched on. And I think it's culture and people's willingness to, to change and be agile is pretty important. Simon, you see a lot of companies that are going through really incredibly difficult times. Can you right. talk about the human side of, of, of this? Of course. Could I just pick up a strategy point first? Yes. Um, I always think when I'm advising clients or doing our own strategy that doing a strategy is more of a mystery than a puzzle. And you think, well, what's the difference? Well, of course, with a puzzle, you have all of the information that you simply need to work out and put together to get the right answer. With a mystery, you actually don't have all the information, so however hard you try, you can't get the perfect answer with the information you've been given. So the reason I say that strategy is more like solving a mystery than a puzzle is because more information comes available as the future develops. One has to incorporate that into information into an evolving strategy. And so this is why corporations fundamentally need to remain agile, because as new information, new technology, new market circumstances become obvious, then the strategy has to be fluid to adapt to that. Now, clearly, line of travel is likely to be largely the same, but how that objective or goal is achieved could be very different. And so disruption cycles are more regular than economic cycles. It's interesting that we're also focused, including me, of course, is when the cycle is going to change. But actually, um, within an economic cycle, there may be several disruption cycles, which are far more profound often uh, on a company or an industry than the economic cycle. So to your question, how does this strategic approach um, planning a corporation's future against uh, an uncertain set of circumstances play at a human level? I mean, clearly, one of the things that I've learned in the work that I do is that a chief executive officer also has to be a corporation's chief communication officer because there's nothing more frustrating or debilitating or paralyzing for a workforce than not knowing where they're going and why they're going there. So what I found is, as a chief executive, and my clients often tell me the same, that it's not until you're heartily sick of, develop, of delivering a message that people actually start to hear it. And so constant and repetitive communication about where we're going, why we're going there, what are the circumstances that make that strategy appropriate, why the future is bright for the company and for people in their careers, is an essential element of a chief executive's job. So gathering people and carrying them with a strategy, particularly if it's, if it's a bold strategy that requires lots of change, is essential. So chief communication officer and chief executive officer uh, happen to be the same person in my view. Um, there's obviously a lot of organizational resistance sometimes to change for very human and understandable reasons. I heard yesterday from the chief executive of IBM that they've, having analyzed, they think that the half-life of a, a person's skills is three years. And so unless we're all uh, evolving our skill base in a really a three to six year period, we become redundant. And of course, particularly for the lower um, paid jobs, there's a real ambient anxiety at the moment as to what AI and machine learning is going to do to the more manual jobs. And so engaging a workforce, explaining what's happening, explaining why the direction of travel is the right one is absolutely critical. And also making sure that to mitigate those anxieties, you also talk about the difficult subject of what happens if people do have to be retrenched, if the workforce does have to change, and what the company is going to do to support them in that in terms of uh, company-sponsored retraining programs that even if they don't end up taking a different job within the corporation, they've actually got, actually got some skilled training to be employable in another one. So the human element of this is really important. Paul, can you comment on that as well, the human uh, side of it? Yeah, go, coming to that. Um, so much you speak about a purpose, right? Strategy, yes. etc. So, um, because at the end of the day, uh, agility and speed with no purpose is, is hyperventilation. Um, right. So we have to watch out for that too. There's a lot of hype also, right. and so you have to really know where you want to go. Uh, so that's the first agility of mind and, and, and judgment. Coming to that, um, and you have been playing with CEO words, and actually. A company, and a company that, like Nestle, uh, that, that has 152 years of history, I'm going to speak about gravity, uh, creates gravity. Um, 
uh, uh, success is the worst of gravities. You hold on to it. Uh, as a physical size, 340,000 people, 430 factories all over the world, gravity. Um, a strong culture, certain dimensions of gravity. So a chief executive officer is actually a chief escape officer. Right. He has to escape from that gravity. And, right. and actually creating that perspective that leads to you defining a good, understandable strategy. Because right. strategy should be simply worded and, 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 and understood. And, and then you have to communicate and indeed and, and chew on that. that. That's one thing. Also, um, apart from a chief um, gravity um, escape officer, it has to be the, the chief entertainment officer. You have to entertain the whole thing. Too. Right. So uh, on the human, it's classical. The picture of top says we have to change. In the bottom, everybody, hey, yeah, we should change. In the middle, say, over over dead body. <laughs> right. So the, the more flatter you have, the better it goes. Right. But, but there's one dimension too, I think, and that has to do with youth. Uh, and we, 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 we as a company, we have a whole uh, commitment and also conviction that youth, bringing young people in your organization and let them have a voice more than in the past, because they understand more what has to be changed right. than you, because at the end of the day, we can understand the Ford Industrial Revolution. You have to be humble. We can rationalize it, etc. But having it in the stomach right. is another thing. Right. So we should give them more space, I think. First of all, we should go after them and allow them to go into your organization, because youth is another ticking social time bomb. That's another topic. <laughs> but, but it helps you to be more agile towards that Ford Industrial Revolution too. So that's a human factor too that helps them to, to, to really translate your organization and to, to, create, to neutralize that, that uh, complacency that is built in and natural to sizable <coughs> companies. And as the past was the big is gonna eat the small, it's the fast and agile that's gonna eat the non-fast and non-agile. We know all that, but these are all easy words. It's how you land it, how you bring it, there's one thing, though, that you have, I feel, as a CEO or who is responsible for a company, to maintain very clear. It is your purpose, linked with your strategy, the what you want to do, and, and it should be, what is your business model? What is, is going to make you make money? Mm -hmm. To have that clear. But also the values. Because in this world that everything is loose and all that, a few things before, for example, Nestle had a strong culture. And all of a sudden they start saying, hey, hey, Nestle has changed, culture is changing. Oh, better. But the values don't. And be very explicit on the values, which are then these lightning rods in the dark of change. And, and that's something that is chef Sache. That's the boss to do. And I think that is linked with this intimate link between strategy, the what and the how, and purpose, the why. Can I just pick up on this? I think it's such an important point, and I couldn't agree more on the values point. Uh, they have to shine through whatever the strategy yeah. evolves as being. I think leadership during times of change is critically important, and in my experience at least, most organisations are over-managed and under-led. And I think there's a real emphasis... Like politics. <laughs> particularly during... I'm going to avoid Brexit. Particularly during <laughs> times of change, where strong leadership is essential. And what does that mean? Well, it means that there has to be authenticity because people are bright. They understand whether people are being authentic or not. So authentic leadership rooted in strong values that don't change whatever the strategy is critically important. And I think there isn't enough conversation around what leadership means during times of rapid change that we're in at the moment rather than management which is, is necessary but it's quite different. Maurice can you comment on what kind of leadership you know what qualities you think a great leader has to have driving the, the kinds of uh, change while maintaining values that Paul and Simon and Andre were talking about? I, I think they, they have um, all uh, covered a lot of the qualities and I'm not sure that they will add a lot but uh, clearly uh, Understanding the world is an essential part. If you don't understand how the world is uh, organized today and where it's going and where are the strengths and where, are, where the trends are coming from, uh, you will hardly be able to uh, design a new strategy. Uh, the, so that is extremely important. The second uh, for me is uh, Communication, but maybe I have a bias because I'm a communication person, but uh, you don't need only to communicate, you need to over-communicate. You, you know, there is a, 
my mentor, Marcel Bustin Blanchet, the founder of Publicis, uh, told me one day, on comprend quand on a compris, uh, which is we understand when we have understood. I said, okay, it's obvious. No, 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 Maurice, think about it. We understand when we have understood. So you have really to integrate everything and finally say, oh, yes, bien sûr, now I understand. And uh, that is something which is uh, uh, critically important. And people, uh, when you communicate, uh, and you, we can tr transpose this to what's happening in the world when it comes to gilets jaunes, the yellow jacket, or when it comes to the vote of the Brexit, when it comes to populism, etc. It's because the politicians and the Everyone has communicated at and not communicated with. And they have believed that because they have delivered a speech, everyone had understood everything which was underlying those speech and the consequences. Unfortunately, not. And uh, it, it takes time to explain. You need to take the time. And uh, if Macron has understood something with this crisis, is to spend six, seven hours to speak at each of the meetings. Six, seven hours because he has not spent the two or three hours that he should have in the past. So the, the, the uh, communication aspect is critical you know, in, in today's world. Then there is the balancing because uh, you, you, you need to balance so many strategies. In today's world, it doesn't suffice to be agile. It doesn't suffice to have the good product. It doesn't suffice to deliver uh, value to the stockholders. You need gender equality. And you have to care about it because it's something which is critically important. You need to think about uh, diversity because when you are a global company, you cannot, ha you cannot have only uh, male Caucasian uh, who are dominating the company uh, because at the end of the day, you go to a, a, a dead end. Uh, you need to think that it's not a stockholder issue, but a stakeholder issue. And uh, you create value for stockholders, but you need to care about all the stakeholders and including your suppliers and including your partners and taking care about the employee of all your employees in order that they have a future. Uh, and there is so many things which are uh, on uh, the shoulders of uh, uh, the CEO uh, that um, we are asking. I'm happy to do not be a CEO anymore because I'm not sure that I will have all the qualities which are needed. But that's, uh, why, that's why it's a CEO. It's a chief everything officer. Too. Exactly. <laughs> I, I fully agree with you. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the human aspect uh, and understanding uh, the, uh, the teams, building teams, uh, combining the right teams, and making the right casting and casting officer is something which is absolutely essential because uh, how you create a multidisciplinary organization uh, with uh, all the right profiles and people who are capable of working together and delivering a product without having an EUO system which is dominating the organization. And last but not least, uh, uh, and probably there is uh, many other aspects. Caring is uh, a caring everything officer. Uh, he has to care uh, about uh, the future, about the people, about the client, about every single aspect. So it's a task which is so heavy that I don't know who can carry that kind of task in the new world. Paul? I think there's something there. Um, it's true, it's so complex, it's so hard. It's sometimes, you know, um, the worst position you can be in is when you start, you still feel you can cover everything. <coughs> That's the worst place you can be. You have to go beyond that and you start to be relaxed again. 
because at the end of the day, you're not alone there. Yeah. And, and, and I think leadership has to do with being able to think in context. It's taking two steps back and observe, and not being actually overruled or overwhelmed by the details and all that. You, you have said something. I think one of the characteristics of a leader in that fast-changing world that induces to agility is curiosity. And, and so the CEO is also the chief Eureka officer because that's, hey, I understand it because I understood. <laughs> it's the Eureka. It's understanding where really the pressure points are, where the change dimensions and gaps are, and fo focusing on that. And being able to, to take distance from all the nitty gritty and all that. That's, you have other people. It's to make these judgment calls. That's leadership at the end of the day. I, uh, I agree. You said management versus leadership. It's different. That's a big difference. Yeah. I agree. I would just add one thing, instinct. And um, if you don't have instinct in your belly, and you don't feel the things. And if you just uh, have a, a fantastic brain and think only with the brain, I'm not sure that you will be a great leader and I'm not sure that uh, you will lead uh, many more people than yourselves. Sometimes too much brain is, <laughs> too much brain is a problem, you know. Uh, Andre, can, <laughs> can you I, 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 comment from a technology? But I will first comment that it's for me, Brain is a little bit more complex than just analytical, analytical Don't power. Don't complicate life again. No, <laughs> fundamentally, <coughs> I, I believe very strongly in intuition and after the analytical brain to see what is making sense, what is not. Now, so, I would just like to come back on one point that I consider extremely important. In a society, that is becoming increasingly complex. So you have different category of people, you have millennials, you have different ethnicity, and so things are more and more complex. Many company and organization are global, and then what is really important is not what you say, is what people understand. And the question is that the different category of people will not understand in the same way. And that is why it's important to repeat some message, but to repeat them from a different angle. Because if you just continue in the same angle, you may believe that people have understood, but then if you have suddenly a sharp turn just due to the event, you may then understand that nobody has understood. And that is extremely important to test in permanence how the message is going through. And not only directly from you to the rest of the organization, but after how it's following the path on the different levels. Because if people under you or two level under have not understood, then you may have some distortion. And then we come to a situation that is extremely difficult. And you're no longer develop. agile. You are exactly. no more agile. At least right. you may be agile on the form, but not on the result. And here, managing technology to come back to the central point is not different than other elements. Simply, things happen faster. Well, let me, I want to make sure we have a few minutes for questions here. So let me ask our audience, and we'll start with you. Please stand up and say your name and organization and where you're from. <coughs> I'm from Mexico. I'm following construction, five generation company. Uh, my question is, uh, you've been talking about a lot of uh, very important things for corporations and for the world to come. And in this fast world that we're going through, I would like to hear what's your uh, response to corporate social responsibilities, because that's something maybe was in the past, but I think it's still alive. Could you tell us a Hello. little bit about that? Uh, uh, yeah. For, for us as a company, um, being responsible uh, is intrinsically linked with our values, but also our strategy. Our strategy is, uh, Nestle, uh, uh, nutrition, health, and wellness, understanding how nutrients and health, that's our strategic direction. But intimately linked with that is uh, the way we go about that, creating shared value. And that's a conviction that a company cannot be successful over time, <laughs> equals shareholder value, cannot be successful over time, if it doesn't create value for society. That means 
where Nestle plays, nutritional products and being aware of the challenges there, uh, working with farmers and being aware of what value we can create and livelihoods for the farmers, etc., etc. And that is linked with one fundamental thing. It is with all the pressures and all the agility and all the hoopla of today, maintain perspective of longer term. We 150 years, we want to be there in 150 years and we're part of a society that has these challenges, etc., etc. This is not by convenience, intrinsically linked by conviction in our strategic direction. That is linked with our values. One of them is our values are based in respect. Respect for oneself, for the other, for the diversity in the world, but also for the future. And when you start thinking about the future, then next generations, environment, uh, and new sustainability, it's all linked there. And you know what? When we have more and more younger people in our organization, that's the first condition they ask their company. So it's actually something that is a motivational dimension and you get the right people in your organization too. So, but you have to maintain that perspective and time. You have to have the short term, I would say sensitivity for the short term and you have to, to get to the long term, you have to survive the short term, that's for sure. But never, and that's how our conviction is, never sacrifice your long term perspective and conviction for the short term. That's, yeah, you cannot regulate there. It's by conviction. That's how we run our business. May I add to that? And I think this whole sense of purpose, which is something you touched on a few minutes ago, is absolutely essential. So I think for all of us, our um, employee base want to know what our purpose is because they want to know whether they affiliate with it or not. So I think purpose is essential. But your point about CSR, what I've learned, at least for our company, but I think for others as well that I've worked with, is that CSR is only real when it plays out in a local community. And so we can have the most wonderful executive level programs, but until the programs play out in the community that our employees live in, or work in, or uh, their churches, or however they engage in their community, it isn't until then that it becomes real. So I think there are many great looking CSO, CSR programs at executive level, but I think where the rubber hits the road is at the community level. And the ones that I've seen be most successful are the ones that have the most traction in the community where the employees live, <coughs> because that then makes it meaningful to them, and then it becomes real. Yes, we had a question back here. Comment of, um, I'm 15 years with this forum here, and it's very impressive this panel today, there's such a uh, kind of uh, exceptional wisdom we are treated with. I built now a project in my seven <coughs> companies group. It's healthcare and insurance and name it. And with the digital era, it's very important to ask a very simple question. Can you simplify, um, maybe I address the panel, but Maurice, but specifically Simon, Paul, I know you all, um, individually, so maybe you can have one uh, sentence how we should start this project to uh, build a smart city, what I'm doing now, this new project, uh, for Japanese and Korean pensioners in Bulgaria, in beautiful Bulgaria. <laughs> So the design is... <laughs> uh, well, I can't pretend to be an expert in any of that, but I, 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 am, I do believe in the principle that change is more profound than we ever imagine, uh, but takes longer than we expect. And so I think in terms of um, a project, I think being as bold as possible in terms of a smart city is essential, but I think being realistic about how long it's going to take to get the uptake and traction in its implementation is also important. Another question, yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Urs Gredig, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of CNN Money Switzerland. I want to come back to something that Mr. Bulke said about long-term and short-term thinking. Uh, we hear that a lot from executives, of course. They all say we are very long-term in this. However, we know there are quarterly uh, uh, results. Uh, we know there are activist investors. We know there are journalists uh, who are asking for these short-term results. If I take a, a concrete example from Nestle, if uh, you have to answer to a, a let's say, a New York-based hedge fund who asks for... Uh, for example. A, a, for example, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who asks, I think by 2022 that you uh, double the earnings per share. How do you deal with that dilemma of, of you know, long-term strategy and very concrete short-term uh, pressure and uh, expectations from investors, for example? Thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> but look, again, it goes to 
to some fundamentals again. He's one investor. We have many others. There are many others who know how we are, what we do. We should not try to explain our long-term thinking as an excuse of not having short-term intensity. If the capacity of delivering is there, we should. If it jeopardizes my future thinking and compromises my future success, I should not do this. My job to explain that and to go around and talk to investors and listen to all of them, right. all of them, also him. And that's how it works. I mean, and, and, and look, it's not because you have one voice that you have fully two, because they know also to pressure point you here and there and tease. I think, uh, and, and to a certain extent, success allows you to talk like I talked. So we, we have to make sure we are successful. We prove that we have a good agenda. And to do that over time, you have to earn it. Actually, short-term consistency in results allows you to have your long-term on your side. Now, um, uh, that's another story when you really have a, a company that is dramatically into trouble. But that's, a, that's another story. First of all, you cannot get to the long term if your house is on fire, kind of. So uh, you have to see case by case, argument by argument. And uh, well, I argument for my company that I know well, and uh, we try to deliver consistently. You know what we want to be as a company at the end of the day, and, um, and that's something I say to investors, that, uh, at the end of the day, strategic direction, consistent uh, over time, value, strong governance, and you go on and you go on, and we try to deliver consistently and, and, and not have that day-by-day -day nervousness that, that, that actually blinds the, the perspective of things. We want to be a dependable company. You can count on us. You can count on us on delivering over time. You can count on us that we are going to be sensitive to societal issues, that we're going to engage with society, with NGOs. You can count on us that our strategic direction is consistent in time. Dependability. Actually, dependability is, is, is one of these things that we lack in society a little bit. Hence, all the anxieties in society. You cannot count anymore on tomorrow is going to be good or better than yesterday and things like that. So that's what we want to be as a company, dependability. Yes, I would like to make a, a few comments on this because uh, uh, activist is uh, a little bit uh, ambiguous. Uh, there are some activists who are really uh, extremely useful because they are putting, uh, shedding a new light on the company, what the company is doing. Some few things that the company is continuing to do that. Uh, uh, leads nowhere and has no future, and uh, they are hesitating to uh, make some arbitration. And they are helping, at the end of the day, at looking at the thing differently. And this is quite positive. And there are some, uh, and I would say the majority of them, uh, of the activists, will really think about maximizing shareholder value, even at the expense of uh, society, employees, the company itself, and the future of the company. And we have seen that very often. And we have seen uh, many activists who were pushing companies to take some immediate action. And at the end of the day, three, four, five years after, where the company is, nowhere. Some completely vanished. So we have to be extremely cautious about this and uh, making sure that there is a balance. And balance is not something which is easy to communicate. People uh, prefer by far uh, that uh, there is uh, some strong points which are made because it's clear, it's simple, and uh, you say maximizing value, you double your earning or your double EPS uh, in three years' time, blah, blah. It's relatively easy to say. And you say, no, it's more complicated than that, so you are lost. Uh, and uh, there is currently a very important debate, which is back to CSR, which is uh, a, a debate of what the company should be. And uh, for example, it's not only in Davos, but uh, we had a, a very important conversation two days ago about uh, the raison d'être of a company. Uh, we have currently in France a, 
a, a huge discussion, uh, including at uh, uh, the uh, executive and legislative uh, aspect uh, regarding uh, the la loi pacte, which is should a company have a raison d'être which goes beyond uh, creating value? What is the impact of the company on um, carbon? What is the impact of the company on society? What is the impact of the company on uh, employment and employability and reskilling the people? Uh, and they can go on and on. And you have uh, Larry Fink, who, who has uh, launched a huge debate about uh, uh, long-term uh, responsibility of company and how they should be uh, uh, managing uh, for the future. So I, I think that uh, uh, asking for a number very often is easy to do, very difficult to answer because you need to go through explanation and people are not always ready to listen and to spend the time to listen because it's complex. We are, again, with this uh, VUCA world. And uh, we, we should be extremely cautious about uh, simplification when it comes to activists. We have time for one very brief last question. I don't know how brief mine was. Um, I'm Marjorie Krauss, and I'm with APCO Worldwide. It's a consulting firm. We recently did a survey of the Fortune 1000 on the question of agility, and we found that four out of 10 CEOs thought that, they, um, that their organizations were kind of fit for the future, um, and you think it's less, right? Now, that's where the problem starts, when you start thinking you're okay. <laughs> okay, right. Um, anyway, the, and we also tried to get them to define what agility was, and there were three factors that came out, and it might be interesting for the discussion. One was active leadership, the other was an enterprising culture, um, and the third one was shared advocacy or shared uh, shared purpose, I guess you'd say. So I, I just thought that was a, an interesting thing. But related to that, and my question was, um, we've also been looking at uh, agility as it relates to social risk, because a lot of companies are asking or are being asked to, uh, as part of shared advocacy, to put their brand um, and, and align it with, a, with um, some kind of uh, external um, issue. And I just wondered um, what you think of that and um, going forward. Thank you. So we, we, we have about two minutes, so we what I would say to your first get a quick point answer. is I think one of the responsibilities <clears throat> of the CEO is in active leadership is actually speaking out on things that matter. And I think in terms of advocacy and engaging in real social issues, I think one of the responsibilities that all CEOs now own is actually taking positions on things because that is um, expected by our colleagues and necessary. So I think those points are interconnected. But we can also add one point, it's, that's an element that is extremely important for a growing number of employees to identify the company with something that is good for the rest of society. And that is making things much easier when the purpose and the value of your company are something that is shared by your employees compared to companies that do things that are much more challenging. If you are in the tobacco industry, it's much more challenging to present yourself in a positive way. Well, we're, we're just about out of time, so I'm going to unfortunately have to wrap us up. I, we've had just an extraordinary discussion. I have three takeaways I want to share with you quickly. One is the definition of agility was um, not well defined in the sense that it has many meanings. It's a state of mind. It's a state of being. It's a perspective, um, it's balance. Uh, secondly, the role of the chief everything officer, I love that description, and the chief communications officer, sort of the overarching um, need to uh, drive it from the top. And then talking about the long-term perspective, maintaining values, maintaining that long-term focus while investing in the future. Those are some of the, the things that I took away today. I want to thank Maurice, Simon, Paul, and Andre. You were absolutely fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. And you did a fantastic job.